I want to make sure we have plenty of time to hear from these amazing students we have joining us today. So welcome everyone to Art at Noon. Today's program is celebrating the ASC, but specifically um, we're featuring some of PAFA's MFA students. I also want to introduce my co-host. I have the fabulous Kate McCammon here running our PowerPoint today. Um, she's PAFA's student experience coordinator. So welcome, Kate. Thank you, Abby. Great to be here. Oh. And to start, I wanted to respectfully acknowledge that our institutional host, PAFA, is on the ancestral lands of the Lene Lenape people, whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. I also have to thank the folks that make free programs like this possible. The Springs, the Springs Art at Noon lectures are supported, supported by the Lefko family in memory of beloved member of the docent corps, Mildred T. Lefko. Just a few things about today's program. If it's your first time tuning in with us, we are recording today's event. So it will be up on PAFA's YouTube channel later today. I'll be sharing a link to that momentarily in the chat. So if you know of anybody who couldn't make it today, feel free to check out that link and share it with folks. We have five amazing MFA, uh, MFA speakers today here with us that they're gonna be sharing a few images from their ASU show and beyond. It's gonna be a whirlwind program. We'll try to have a little bit of time at the end for questions, but know that it will probably be a little bit brief. So if you have words of congratulation for the students, please feel free to put those in the chat. Or if you have questions for those artists specifically, you can put those in and we'll try to make time at the very end for that as well. I also have to mention that if you're lucky enough to be in the Philadelphia region, you should try to come and see some of this work in person if you haven't already. The annual student exhibition is gonna be on view until June 5th in the Hamilton building. So we hope you can, you can make it in person if at all possible. So, we're gonna now get started. It's my honor to hand it over to our first student. We have Belle Kim here with us to kick it off. Belle, take it away. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, Abby. Uh, my name is Belle Kim. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all of the faculty, professors, and school officials who trust and endure us for two years during the difficult time of the pandemic. Thank you so much. Um, as you see, my ASE is on installation. I never thought I'd be sculpting or creating installation art. But I think the biggest change, change I've had since I got into this school is my attitude towards the work of art. Some people disagree, but what I realized the most in this school is that the creative work I do is a means of finding myself, no matter what I use. So I decided to explore various materials as much as I can in PAFA. And PAFA allowed me to explore everything I want. So this form of installation art allows me to express my own point of view about the city and its coexistence with nature, people, time, and materials. My work creates various and numerous angles depending on the physical characteristics of the room, like lighting and size of objects placed in different spaces. The viewer is able to see different perspective of my city depend, depending on their position in the room. Next slide, please. To understanding uh, my work, I mean, to understand my work, I will start by reading my short uh, work note. I hope that this will be an opportunity for viewers to think again about what life means more than just what it's in from the outside. 
in some way, I want you audience to find me amongst these city objects. My city installation is the result of my feeling of alienation while walking around Philadelphia and my memories of growing up in a city called Seoul. Buildings in the city are only shells for strangers. The pigeons in the building have become helpless birds that have become a piece of the city and have forgotten the meaning of flying. All of these buildings windows stare close at me. However, each window has a hidden life inside, which lives in a completely different time and world. The story of the city is covered in cloth. Next slide, please. So this is the scene from the entrance of my installation. I think my installation is a puzzle. Through my installation, I think the task of people recalling their own memories, reminiscing and remembering themselves is to put together puzzles. So this work is both a self-portrait of the city and uh, the city is our self-portrait. I want each of my objects to have its own voice and as objects and objects become connected and overact, they create relationship, create different scenes and create different stories. Next slide, please. It's not just uh, the objects that I made, but my installation overlaps with the uh, actual or urban landscape outside, blurring the interior and exterior space, asking constant question about what's real and what's imaginary, uh, imaginary, what's the subject and what's the object. This is the theme of my work. Next slide, please. The whole installation creates a, a scene, but hopefully the scenes that the audience captures will uh, create each other's story, like this picture, or next slide, please, or these pictures. Next slide, please. So this last image of my installation was taken taken in the evening outside of the window. I took this picture several days ago and uh, my work and night feels so different from the day, daytime. It's like a city that wake up at night. The bright, really bright lit interior seems to create a more lonely atmosphere. And it also reminds me of Seoul right now, where my daytime becomes their nighttime. So uh, Papa gave me generous support. They allowed me to display in three different space for my installation work. Um, and it was good study to understand the relationship between object and relationship between the audience and the space and the, the work of my work. For sure, I could change this art form for my next, next project, depending on what I want to say. And it could be a painting, drawing, or maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe performance. <laughs> and I think this is the power I got from Papa. I'm not afraid to make any form of art. So what can I say? Just come to school and see our work and please walk through in my installation. Thank you. Hi everybody. Um, that was really beautiful, Belle. And uh, I loved hearing you talk about your work. Um, 
My name is Macy Kozajewski. Um, I'm super grateful to everybody who's uh, joined us today and for um, being able to have this conversation with y'all. Um, I tend to talk really fast, so I'm gonna try to like slow myself down. Um, and we'll start with uh, the fact that my presentation today, is, all my images are chronological are in chronological order. Um, to help me tell the story pretty concisely of my four years at PAFA trying to get my MFA. Um, and uh, where we'll start is with Ruthie's Quilt, which is a 2019 project that I made in um, after a residency at uh, Shaw Island, Washington. Um, at the at that time, I was making a lot of socio-political work um, or based in my sort of personal histories and contexts of the war on drugs and food disparity um, and uh, other effects of capitalism, which were all really heavy topics and really um, big things for me to chew on. And I remember coming back to PAFA after the uh, residency and um, needing like a palate cleanser or something light. And I thought back on, you know, the presentness that the residency demanded and the community building that happened very organically and naturally. Um, and I thought, why not make a gift for the person that, um, what, that I grew really close with during my time there, um, Ruthie, the caretaker of the grounds. Um, so this quilt was made out of baseball caps and reclaimed fabric, uh, my own shirts and jeans. Um, and it was a really sweet moment for me to be able to make something that wasn't um, grounded in kind of like large systemic issues. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but this piece uh, would start two different things for me. It would start a series, a gift series, um, where I would make uh, gifts for people that I'm close to, um, friends and family and others. Um, and it would start my thesis research into care and conflict and capitalism and community building. Um, next slide, please. So these next three sculptures are uh, all work that I made when I was re-entering PAFA after a year uh, deferral in 2020. Um, that pandemic year, I was looking at, I was looking at and learning from a um, lot of the uh, grassroots efforts of mutual aid and um, the civil unrest um, and out from that came these three uh, objects that are made in different materials. Um, and uh, looking back on making them, I noticed that I recognize them as all tools of dismantlement as well as uh, rebuilding. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Uh, so I looked at the steel carton and I looked at the, the brick and um, the next one will be leather hammer, but we don't have to go there just yet. Um, and I was playing around with a little bit more randomness in, in my process. Uh, my initial process coming into school was to plan everything out um, before I even started making and uh, I kind of shifted gears into um, doing something a little bit more intuitive. Um, and that's how these three pieces sort of came about. Um, next slide, please. I, the process for making most of these was to kind of look at the things I already was looking at conceptually um, these tools, but to pair them and associate them with materials that I just found pleasing or interesting. So leather and steel and um, brick and mirror pieces. Um, I'm really interested in material exploration. Um, 
I, uh, thank you, Abby. Um, I like working with my hands and I also realized that being at PAFA, um, I needed to jump into the things that scared me or that I felt like I was afraid of um, in terms of making. And I was able to meet head on, um, uh, you know, hurdles or uh, learning new things and not being afraid of making mistakes. Um, and that's how I got to sort of the comfortability to um, make work that was more intuitive um, because I was so sort of locked and loaded in my brain that I didn't have a whole lot of space in my body to help um, guide me while I was making. But these three pieces totally changed that for me. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so thinking about um, all these types of things that were sort of like not grounded, but I was taking little bites of like my intuition and material exploration and, um, you know, larger ideas of care and how care shows up um, within ourselves and within others and in the group and the community. Um, I made these next two pieces um, kind of in a completely backwards process from where I started. So I allowed my um, intuition to guide me. I made them um, mostly with like, of course I'm gonna say mostly with my body, but it was like my body that was making these decisions instead of my brain. Um, and once it was only once the pieces were finished that I was able to like retroactively look at them and kind of get a sense for where they were coming from within me, um, either subconsciously or a new word that I've discovered is super consciously, which I think is kind of cool. Um, and What's nice about these next two pieces for me is that because they don't come from like one specific thought in my brain, deriving a single, like a single or a singular meaning from them is almost impossible for me. Um, so I like where they come from with um, openness, uh, openness for interpretation. Um, and when I think about all of that now, I believe that relates well to the research I was doing in care and conflict and capitalism and community building uh, in terms for nuance and how everything is kind of rhizomatic instead of just black and white and how things are um, the many, many shades of, of gray and how they link up into each other, how like conflict can be a form of care for when we think about how we show up in conflict, um, how care can be anti-capitalist um, through how we show up in building community. Um, and I think not only were those things going on for me in my art practice, but they were going on for me in my live, lived experience and my interactions every day with my community at PAFA. Um, through the critiques uh, with our professors and critics, through the conversations with peers um, and um, how a community is one living, breathing organism that is going to have its um, compassion and it's going to have its conflict and it's going to be all kinds of um, like an amalgamation. Next slide. And so where I've landed is in a very strange place for me because I can't, I don't really have one target goal in mind. Um, I am enjoying very much the fluidity with which materials and ideas come to me. I've learned to loosen my uh, death grip on the things that I make. Um, and it is a space now for me for contemplation. And this is my final piece where um, just thinking about the piece in, as a whole, um, and it feels like a self-portrait.
So um, I think that's where I'm at. And uh, thanks for letting me speak. Hi, my name is uh, Eustace Mamba. Um, first, I want to uh, express condolences to the victims and families in Buffalo. Um, next slide. Uh, so I think I, the best way to describe my practice is to kind of explain where I'm at. Um, I've been at PAFA for maybe four or five years. I got my undergraduate and then graduate degree. Uh, when I first came to PAFA, I was really interested in learning more about um, the formal figurative world of the fine arts and mastering that for myself, really uh, learning the secrets and mastering it for myself. And a lot of that required working within the four corners of a frame, within a canvas, a more colonial way of creating images. Um, and by the time I got to my graduate degree, I really dove myself into ideas surrounding decolonization and also figuring out my own um, visual language. Um, so this piece right here, untitled Self-Immolation, kind of represents the end of my formal practice and the beginning of experimentation and going towards a new way of creating. Um, next slide. Um, so <laughs> by the time I reached my third semester, I was kind of frustrated in my studio practice and didn't really know where I was going in my practice. Um, I had dozens of paintings and didn't really have an idea of the direction that I was gonna go. Um, but one thing I knew is that I didn't want to work within the conventional four corners of a frame within a canvas. So this piece right here was kind of my first experiment. Um, I actually uh, cut the canvas from the from the frame and restitched it to the canvas. And it kind of represented for me the beginning of trying something new and also being in between worlds, which also represents which also relates to this painting, um, which is called Life on the Line. Um, in this piece, I was uh, trying to illustrate uh, a part of inner city culture, uh, shoes on a telephone line, something that we all see when we uh, drive around. Um, it has so many different meanings to so many different people. Um, but for me, it kind of represents being in between worlds. Um, you know, it could represent a memorial for somebody's death, or it could represent the start of something new, you know, throwing an old pair of shoes on the line and getting a fresh pair. Um, so that in-between worlds and also in-between practices um, is very relatable for me and also what I was going through in my practice. Next slide. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, after in-between worlds, uh, I realized that I wanted to shred more of my paintings. So I basically started cutting apart dozens of paintings in my studio. Um, and basically turning them back into raw materials. Um, they went from being these compositions and images into being swatches of colors, uh, paint chips, um, and the building blocks for new ideas. Um, at first I started gluing them together. I tried tying them together um, and nothing really satisfied me. Um, so I decided to bring in my sewing machine and I started sewing the pieces of canvas together um, and creating these things that I'm calling mixed media assemblages. So this piece right here is an example of the mixed media assemblages that I started to create. Um, it probably has like 10 different paintings in it um, that I stitched together and uh, composed. And it also has a lot of found materials and textiles that I've collected over the past few years. Um, the piece is about, uh, the inner city and uh, the corner store, which is you know where many people in inner city go to get most of their food. It's kind of the center of their world. Um, my thesis revolved around ideas of slow violence and um, slow violence was a topic and idea created by an environmentalist named Rob Nixon. Um, Rob Nixon focused primarily on environmental slow violence. So whether that be uh, pollution, or many of the other things that are man-made that slowly affect us in violent ways and destroy our environment. Um, for my thesis and for the work I presented in my ASC, I wanted to highlight that slow violence applies to more than just the environment. It applies to people and environments that they exist in, especially 
communities of color or um, um, low income communities uh, in the United States and across the world and also in the Western world. Um, and the corner store is kind of the center of that. You know, this is where people go. This is where, this is where life really revolves around. Um, next slide. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> so uh, this piece kind of represented me going further into that exploration um, and bringing myself back into it. So it's a semi self portrait slash illustrative piece that represents how the inner city and places like the corner store are chewing on black existence or inner city existence and the people that exist within the inner city. Um, I call it the piece live bait chewing on black rocks to kind of um, illustrate that. Um, but yeah, this, this really was uh, a huge jump for me in my practice. You know, um, this piece is a freestanding piece, it has dozens of paintings within it. Um, and yeah, um, next slide. <laughs> Uh, to go further into that exploration, I decided to think about some of the foods that people are eating within the inner city, uh, you know, where they aren't getting access to things like, you know, fresh vegetables and other nutrition, nutritional food options. Um, and, you know, in replacement, they're getting cheap junk food like uh, Cheetos or, you know, dollar cheese steaks or, you know, other types of junk food. Um, so this piece uh, is called Chi Chi's. Um, and it was me really meditating. Well, it's not called Chi Chi's. It's called the mascot be cool, but you know, the other name is Chi Chi's. Uh, and um, it's really about, you know, um, what people are eating in the inner city. You know, um, I want to really capture these moments before they're gone. Um, and also, you know, elevate them and uh, bring attention to them. Next slide. Uh, this piece is called Flaming Hot Cheetos. So this is uh, kind of about the people who are eating these kind of foods in the inner city um, and what it's doing to them. Uh, so this is an illustration slash abstract painting slash portrait slash assemblage that I created um, of a child who might live in the inner city, uh, a child of color. Um, and kind of the reaction slash effects that eating spicy junk food like Flaming Hot Cheetos might have on them. Um, for many kids nowadays, eating these foods is a rite of passage. You know, it's kind of like a bravado. It kind of shows that they're tough, you know, but, you know, it also leads to all kinds of issues internally, you know, whether that be obesity or different types of organ failure. Um, because of the level of spice within them. So I wanted to create a face that was kind of contorted, manipulated, um, but also excited slash um, thrilled. Uh, and this is what I came up with. Um, originally, this piece was a free floating piece, like some of the other pieces I showed before, but um, I decided to uh, attach it back to a canvas to kind of show that I'm still teetering between a very formal world and also a very experimental, abstract, decolonized world. Next slide. And finally, um, this piece called The Entanglement was one of the last pieces I created um, uh, at PAFA. And it was kind of an extension of everything else I was creating. I wanted to really uh, illustrate what it feels like to be entangled within these slow violences within the inner city, tying them to addiction, tying them to addiction, and tying them to violence, tying them to junk food, tying them to stereotypes and monoliths that might not represent who they actually are. Um, so yeah, this piece, uh, has a lot of different elements, you know, that combine some of the themes from other elements and also kind of represents where I hope to continue exploring um, now that I'm a graduate of the program. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you guys so much. Marley, I think you're muted. Right. 
We're going to give Marley a second to join us. It wouldn't be Zoom if there wasn't some sort of hiccup. I think, yeah, I think she said she was having um, some issues with her Wi-Fi just a second ago. Oh, um, thank you. There we go. Yeah, Athena, do you mind if we go to you then? And then we'll- Sure, sure. Marley? <laughs> thank you. An amazing job so far, everyone. These are so inspiring. Thank you all. Okay, so um, I guess I'll start by saying, oh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Athena Scott. Um, and uh, coming into PAFA, I came in uh, strictly as, well, not strictly, but mostly as a painter, um, I'm doing portraits. Um, and my goal in coming into PAFA was to um, expand beyond that and just try a little bit of everything. Um, so with my ASE exhibition or my presentation, I wanted to kind of uh, give kind of examples of the different uh, materials um, in, I guess, the different ways that I've kind of um, um, explored expressing the ideas I have outside of painting. So this piece here, um, A Stranger in the Village, uh, was one of the uh, first pieces that I did that helped me um, see that I could do that. Um, this is uh, A Stranger in the Village is an essay by James Baldwin. Um, and in this piece, I'm trying to, um, I guess, think of uh, I was imagining him writing this essay and um, thinking about all the uh, pivotal events that happened um, during his time or, or, or that era. Um, and then also thinking of the parallels of, of uh, today, of, of our time now um, and noticing that, you know, there are par parallels between now and then in thinking of, you know, how history repeats itself, thinking of like, what are we doing to actually kind of um, change things? Um, and, you know, what individually, like our place is in that history. Um, so this was, uh, this piece right here was actually, um, kind of hard to work through, but it's like probably one of the uh, pieces that I'm kind of most proud of because it really got me to step outside my comfort zone and um, to see that I can kind of um, explore those ideas that I'm thinking about in, in different forms. Um, next slide, please. This was also um, pretty much a part of that same um, um, theme. Um, and it's also inspired by the same um, essay. Um, this is called, I, I Remain As Much A Stranger. Uh, and this is kind of the thought of kind of being um, um, in this place or in an environment and it's all that you know, but you still kind of feel like you're a stranger or you're being treated as a stranger and an outsider. And, um, so it's that being seen and, and not, or being ignored. Um, so that's what I tried to convey with this piece. Um, so it, with these two, I was kind of thinking of in, um, in a more general sense, as far as like, you know, um, the things in history that have kind of repeated in you know, haven't really been like truly like addressed or, you know, or, or come to some type of like resolved or resolve. Um, so this year I kind of wanted to kind of think of that same, um, I guess, thought, um, but bring it a little bit more closer to me directly. So I started um, tapping into my own kind of family history and journey um, and thinking of, you know, things that we've carried uh, through generation, um, through generations and thinking of what I've kind of carried along um, that may be positive or negative that has, you know, um, been in my family history. Um, next slide, please. 
So for this, um, it's called a prayer um, for the children. Um, this piece is about uh, just over five, uh, five feet by seven and a half feet wide. Um, and it's on um, wood panel. Um, this was um, inspired by a family, um, a photo that my mom had um, of her when she was a child. Um, and she was in church. Uh, my uncle is also in this photo. Um, initially, I was attracted to it because me and my mother look so much alike. And in some ways, it was like looking at it was like almost inserting me into that time. Um, so I just couldn't like really kind of like escape this image. Um, but then as I started to kind of um, look at the image again, um, like I said, this is a, 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 a group photo of children um, in, in a church setting. Um, I think they were, they were gathered at the front to take a photo and then also a prayer was said over them. Um, so I'm just like looking at all of these, these young faces, these babies, um, and thinking about what their journey was from this time to now. Um, as I said, my mom and my uncle are in this photo and my uncle um, just turned 70 recently. So uh, this photo was taken in Philadelphia and, you know, I wonder like, have I crossed paths with any of these people or, or people, um, their relatives um, thinking about, you know, are they still with us or, you know, are, are they no longer with us? Um, so I think in this, I'm trying to kind of give them their own story as well. Um, next uh, slide, please. Um, so that was more so about like the past um, and this is more so about the present. Um, so I'm thinking of my mother and my uncle's journey um, and all the things that they had to go through um, and whether positive or negative, like we're all kind of still progressing and kind of uh, journeying through, you know, all that's kind of circling around us. And um, this is Jeremy, he's actually my nephew um, and he's just such a light in, it's just with those, these two pieces, Jeremy and the, the uh, prayer, it's just, I think they go well together um, to kind of um, show that kind of connection between past and present. Um, uh, next slide. So as I'm kind of working on these, like, you know, these pieces and, you know, thinking about my family's journey, journey and history, um, I'm thinking about my connection um, in, in, I guess, my thread um, that connects uh, to everyone. So I guess with, again, with my ASE, I guess I kind of see it just as a self-portrait overall of kind of like all these pieces that, you know, are a part of me um, and that make me who I am. Um, so this right here is, um, also a, a, as you can see, it's a screen print. I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. It's a screen print, um, of a family reunion photo that, um, my grandmother and great grandmother are in, um, some of the people who are in this photo, I'm not really sure, like their exact relation to me, but I know that they're a part of me, um, in, this is a way of kind of joining my spirit with theirs. Um, next slide. Memory is a hymn is a uh, portrait of uh, me and my father. I think it's kind of uh, self-explanatory. Um, it's just, uh, I think a lot of my work deals with like memory um, and trying to, you know, keep those things that like are important to us. Um, and then next slide is, this is a sculpture that I did. I call it a self-portrait. Um, in the photo, I don't know if you can necessarily see it as clearly, but there are 
um, images of different family members that have come before me, my, my elders. Um, and then there's kind of like an overall view of like my, uh, my own portrait. And I just feel like this kind of sums up my journey this, um, this year of me just kind of really just invest, investigating that family history. And, um, and also to my journey with like uh, materials and really trying to kind of express that. Um, I guess what I'm, uh, I guess that, 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 that family history that, you know, those, those, all those changes and um, things we had to do to kind of adapt to get to the, to where we are today. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> I'm sorry if that was all over the place, but I really do appreciate you all um, listening and, and joining us today. Hi everyone. Sorry for the tech hiccup. Um, my name is Marley Parsons and um, before I begin, I want to thank everyone in the PAPA community who's supported us throughout this time in the program. Um, so before, um, let's see, before I get into what I, my show is about, I wanted to give a brief interview of my time at PAPA. So I came into the program working on acrylic abstract landscape paintings. And the intention for me going to grad school was to explore the footprint and waste that comes with having an art practice. So um, during my first semester, I quickly moved away from the landscape painting and started experimenting with using only the materials I had, found materials, and I started natural dyeing and painting with turmeric and cabbage juice, olive juice, beets, and trying to sustainably source pigment powder and then moving into making my own paint with rocks. Uh, so throughout this time, I discovered that the research and the process and the documentation of these explorations was really the foundation of my practice. So I shifted my focus into doing more documentation based work with photography and video. And last year I was awarded the PAPA Fellow for the two-week artist residency at Mass Mocha. And this time was super crucial for me and my practice in so many ways. But the main takeaway that I took from this residency is that it reminded me of why I gravitated towards landscape painting in the first place and um, was so concerned with cultivating a sustainable art practice and my love for new and old places and also my love for our earth and where we come from. And um, that residency made these notions came through really clearly. Um, next slide, please. So for um, my ASE installation, I um, put together my first actualized site-specific installation called Respiration. Um, this project is based in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It consists of investigations and explorations of the macro and microcosms within a forest. Um, humans connect interconnectedness and separateness and relationship to trees, circles, cycles, and the necessity of prescribed forest burns. So the piece you're seeing here is a still from a five minute video inspired by a few words from Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Breeding Sweetgrass. And her quote is, respiration, the source of energy that lets us farm and dance and speak. The breath of plants gives life to animals and the breath of animals gives life to plants. My breath is your breath, your breath is mine. It's a great poem of give and take, a reciprocity that animates the world. So this still from this video that I made, it's a five minute video and um, it's me pretending as if I was a tree moving throughout this forest and there's an audio of my breath kind of reiterating this interconnectedness that we have and that we all breathe together in the same space all the time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this piece is called Untitled Visual Notes of Forest Succession Stages After a Prescribed Burn. It's a digital photograph on canvas. 
Um, I became interested in prescribed forest burns after researching how burning is a necessary restoration method and how fire can be destructive, but it can also be restorative at the same time. So after doing research on rewilding theories, uh, this notion reiterated that when done responsibly and respectfully, humans can work in concert with forests and help restore these ecosystems. So this work to me um, emphasize the reciprocal relationship that we're supposed to have with the earth in order for us to thrive. Um, and while capturing these images, I also collect charcoal from the most recent burn that they did in the Pine Barrens, which I made multiple drawings with in my show. Next slide, please. Uh, this piece is called Untitled Automatic Drawing 5, and it's a pen on paper. Uh, this was one of the few sketches I did in plein air while in the Pine Barrens after I was done gathering images and materials. And I wasn't surprised that unconsciously all of these sketches resembled tree bark and interconnectivity within the space. Next slide, please. This piece is titled Untitled, A Drawing with Gathered Matter. It's a digital photograph on paper. And this work is a semi-critique on first-generation land artists and a few works in particular that involved excavation of land and the potential altering and harming of the ecosystems where they were. So as a third-generation artist, environmental artist, I really wanted to experiment with making ephemeral land art by rearranging found materials and leaving as little trace and imprint as possible. Next slide, please. This piece does not have a title yet, but it is a scanned film photograph printed on my own handmade paper. I think you've frozen, Marty, unfortunately. And such an amazing image too. It's truly fantastic. I think we're going to give Marley a second to see if she can rejoin. Um, in the meantime, we'll have a few minutes for questions. So if folks want to take a second and put things in the chat, we'd love to hear from you, specifically questions for the artists. Um, Yeah, Kate, I think with your permission, maybe we could stop the PowerPoint and transition to the Q&A. And if Marley comes back, then we can restart She's that. having computer mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. She's working. Yeah, it happens. We're, we're in this time. So <laughs> if Marley can rejoin us. We will throw those images on so she can finish talking. But yeah, and we, I, hear, I see something from Clint. Clint, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hold on one second. Uh, let's do all right go for it Clint we love hey, to hear thanks from Abby you. thanks so much for hosting this and uh congratulations and thanks to uh the artists for your uh wonderful presentation so I, I asked this question at the undergraduate um presentation and I know it's so different when you're in graduate school um because you're coming in you know much more fully formed in your artistic vision but my question is um and, and, and I guess I'll, I'll preface it by saying, I know you all talked about how your work evolved, but if you think about the artist that you were when you entered PAFA and the work that you were making, and then where you are now, what, what's most surprising to you? In your work or your, you know, how you think about your work? I think for me, um, not a lot has changed. Like I, I, I might be making these very expressive, colorful mixed media kind of assemblages now somewhat, <laughs> but um, I'm still dancing around the same ideas and topics and themes that I have for almost 10 years now, way before I came back to college. Um, and sometimes it's like, it feels very like spiritual or, um, like meant to be or something, you know, like um, that I keep on coming back to these same themes. But every time I come back to them, you know, I have new thoughts and new ways of expressing it. 
and it's exciting for me. And I look forward to seeing like how uh, what I'm considering the new me right now becomes the old me in the future, God willing. Um, I think with my uh, experience here, I think I've just been, um, it's just been an exciting time creatively and just kind of um, allowing myself to kind of be open in, um, you know, to new things and not really um, holding myself back from, from stepping outside uh, my comfort zones. Um, and then when I actually, when I go back to say painting, uh, which is like my my main kind of thing that I, I do, I do feel there's a difference. Um, and I think there's a better understanding in why I paint the way I paint um, because I've allowed myself to kind of be more open. Um, so I think the experience here has, um, it's kind of just to kind of, it's allowed me to kind of see just kind of like the tip of like what I can do. Um, and I'm kind of like looking forward to, you know, what's to come. I kind of missed the question. Can, can you repeat it? <laughs> Maybe I was I was kind of thinking about you uh, as I was asking it because we were talking about that quilt piece, which was I think one of the first pieces that you made that's in the show. But my question was just as you think about where your work was when you started the program and where your thinking was as an artist and where you are now and your work is now. What surprises you the most? Okay, um, I guess what surprises me the most uh, is like how, like looking back, how much those things kind of I've carried with me, like those initial, like that quilt piece I made in 2019, but it was actually like the foundational piece to a lot of like my practice now. And I was just super unconscious of it, you know? And um, it's like my immediate practice was the things going on around me but there's also a lot that goes on with inside of me and everybody, right? Artists or not. Um, and how it like, how much time I'm now spending like digging through the insides of me and like the inner workings and um, how much more I have to learn about just myself. Yeah, thank you for that question, Clint, and for everyone's answers. We have just a few minutes left. Um, maybe while people are thinking, I have kind of a sister question to Clint because it's a bit about reflecting. Um, but I was wondering if anybody, this is to all of you, but you know, thinking about putting together your ASC installation, I know that that's a big transition, moving those things out of your studio into a museum to hang in the wall. And so I was wondering if anyone could share a discovery you made about your work after seeing it installed or something that surprised you. I know that that can be a really interesting moment, especially as you graduate. Yeah, Belle? Um, I think for, for me, it was like, um, I guess seeing everything all together um, and realizing how connected they actually were. Um, I don't think I initially went in saying, I'm going to do this and do that. And it's just all going to come together and make sense. Um, they were all like individual pieces. Um, but once it got into the space, um, I think actually like it made everything make sense. I felt like, um, and was like, oh, okay, this is what I was doing. And this is, this is what it, what it, it sums up. This is everything that, you know, this is the path I experience or, or just my experience in this moment in time. This is, this is what it is um, in, in my work. Yeah, I mean, as my, like, uh, as you see, my work is installation and I use that amazing space in the Broad Street studio. So, uh, once I felt I had enough to start assembly, I just bring all of my materials into there and let my mind free and begin again to tie all of the pieces together to create a story. 
initially I didn't think about creating the entire story. It just happened naturally. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh yeah, Macy, go ahead. Installing was like a nightmare for me. <laughs> it's it because at that point I had all these things that I had made and I was just like, I don't know where any of this is coming from. Um, so it was a matter of like figuring out how they all talk to each other um, because they don't all talk to each other in the most direct way. Um, but it was it was nice to have it done and I am um, a better person for it. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. And thanks for the honesty, Macy. I know that it can be, it's not always the most enjoyable experience, but it's so great to see your work on the other side of it together. Um, we have a, a great question from um, Eustace too, asking what was the most impactful and, and or transformative critique you received about your work? I'll go first. Hey, Dad. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I, think, I think all my critiques have been impactful and transformative at PAFA, um, especially me, especially uh, as an artist of color. Um, I've really tried to, uh, like I said in my presentation, uh, decolonize my work and go against the convention. And all that was driven by the graduate program. Sometimes my critiques felt like warfare. <laughs> like I, I know all my colleagues can, can attest to that um, because I disagreed with the opinions of my critics. But, you know, I think regardless of how it might have appeared, uh, the dialogue was healthy and also a learning experience for both sides uh, because you know for me it kind of made me resolute in my drive to disrupt and make people who are used to a very colonial way of looking at art uncomfortable and for them to see that you know um, people like me are steadfast in our vision and you know it might not make sense to them but you know you know in the future it will Thank you, Eustace. Anyone else? Macy? Yeah. Um, so my most impactful critique was uh, a group critique at the end of last semester where I had almost nothing to show, just like piles of materials. I was nowhere in any, I was not locatable in any type of making. Um, and emotionally, I didn't know where I was either. And I cried. Um, I had a really cathartic cry in my critique in front of my classmates and in front of my critics. And um, the uh, most transformative part of it was that like it, I needed that to happen and there was space that and people there that allowed for that to happen and um, you know didn't try too hard to avert it or to um, you know because our natural inclination is to make things better but it was necessary for it to happen. And I am still so grateful and appreciative of everybody who was there that day. And uh, I was there, Macy. <laughs> and yeah, I think it was the same day. Uh, one of the faculty was crying you know, after seeing my installation. Uh, is there a moment that's as touching as my work made someone cry? So it was a great moment for me. Oh, thank you to you both. I think that's a perfect way to say goodbye on, you know, at the power of crying <laughs> for a release, but also the power of art. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for sharing your work. It's it's truly inspiring. It's been great to, to hold this space with all of you. And thanks to everybody who came. Please, if you can, come see the work in person. It's on view until June 5th. So I'll let our speaker say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for showing up.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care.